What do you love about life? Let's see what's been shared by those who chose to share. Someone said, I love food. And then they put in parentheses, too much. And I love the dawn. I love being a new grandmother. I love pancakes, somebody said, and family. And there's about six or so echoes of family. Someone included family, which includes my cat, Cleo. Reading a great book and being lost in the story. Someone said, I love swimming, in addition to family and faith and travel. Someone on Zoom said, I love family. And someone else on Zoom said, I love Jay and Alice. Amen. <laughs> I add to this, and there's many who didn't share, and so maybe what you love is captured here. Art, music, the sound of laughter, laughing, friends, and really good food. Someone already said ice cream and pizza, and I like really good greens and cornbread. I had the opportunity to go to an Ethiopian restaurant the other day, my second or third time. I love Ethiopian food. I love the lake, lakefront, and trees and flowers, amazing landscape that God has given us across this world. I love vacationing to beautiful places. I love dancing. Some of you may love dancing as well. Any other dancers around? Even if you don't dance well, you love dancing. Amen. I especially love when God winks at me, you know that thing we call serendipity or we call it um, coincidences. I call God incidences. I, got, I love God, my relationship with God. I love family and I could go on and on and I'm sure you could as well. I love life. Isn't life just amazing? In the Gospel of John, the 10th, chapter 10th verse speaking to his followers Jesus said I came so that they could have life indeed so that they could live life to the fullest Jesus came so that we we are the they his followers that we could live life to the fullest so that we could enjoy art and music, the dawn, being a grandmother, pancakes, and, and uh, the cat Cleo, so that we could love Jay and Alice and, and watch them hold hands right in front of me throughout worship service, such a beautiful display of love, so that we could love swimming. Jesus came so that we could love the wonderful landscape that God gave us so that we can love those times when God surprises us, so we could love things like comedy and birthdays and birthday cake. Today's message is simple. Unforgiveness in our lives blocks us from living. It blocks us from all the things we love. Unforgiveness blocks us from fully enjoying or the opportunities to enjoy art and music and laughter and laughing and friends and family and good food, ice cream and pizza and peanuts and walnuts and all the things that we love, including love. Let me illustrate. Some of us have missed weddings, birthday parties, and baby showers because of unforgiveness, either ours or someone else's unforgiveness toward us. Some of us have missed vacations and graduations and holiday meals because of unforgiveness either ours or someone's unforgiveness 
of us. Some of us have missed school recitals and plays, simply a nice walk in the community with a friend or dinner or taking in the Chicago Symphony Orchestra or simply enjoying a beautiful sunshiny or even rainy day with someone we love because of unforgiveness, either ours or someone's unforgiveness towards us. John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come, Jesus said, that they may have life and have it to the full. And I, and I think that's the, the New International Version. Let me give you the common English version, which I enjoy so much. The thief enters only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came so that they could have life indeed, so they could live life to the fullest. The thief, the thief comes in many forms. Today, the form I'm focusing on is un- Forgiveness, I know I might be right on your pew, so you may be wondering, how did I come to preach on forgiveness? I'm glad you asked. On August 24th, President Biden announced his student loan forgiveness plan, and the country went in, or shall I say, came out loudly, many for it and many against it. And I don't think there's been much chatter like this in social media about a presidential decision since the Affordable Care Act announced by President Obama. There are people, maybe even Christians, since according to statistics, our country is estimated to be 70 percent Christian. It's likely they consider themselves Christian who are downright angry about the student loan forgiveness plan. There are some states that are promising to tax loan forgiveness. And in the midst of all of this, God placed on my heart that it's not just forgiveness of other people's debt that's a problem for some in, of the millions of Christians in our nation, but forgiveness in general is a problem. People, Christians, many of us struggle to forgive. We struggle to pardon, to free people from our anger for their art against us. We struggle to let go of our anger. We struggle to forgive and, and to restore relationships, some very important relationships in our lives. And, and God sent me this morning to shine a light on that which we'd like to keep in darkness. And that is our inability to forgive. So I gently, or maybe it may not feel so gentle, I gently shine a light on that which is keeping many of us from living life to the fullest. That's stopping many of us from enjoying the things we love. And if you're under the sound of my voice and you love Jesus, it's my responsibility to help you understand the ethics of Jesus and the mission of Jesus, that Jesus came that you might have life to the fullest, that you enjoy a life full of family and friends and music and art and good food and peace, joy, love and happiness, and that this is available for all and that you even participate in making sure that all have access to peace and love and joy and, and food and music and all the wonderful things that life has to hold. Jesus came that we might all have life and enjoy it to the fullest. And Jesus loves and believes in forgiveness and that the two, life and forgiveness, go together. Forgiveness is central to our faith. We believe that Jesus died for our sins. In other words, that Jesus forgave our sins, and that's why through faith in Jesus, we have eternal life. 
The practice of communion, which we will celebrate today, is that reminder that through the broken body and shed blood of Jesus, our sins are forgiven. So forgiveness is one of the primary virtues of our faith. Yet many of us live with unforgiveness in our hearts. There are reasons for the unforgiveness. I understand that. Some acts against us by others were egregious. I, I, I get that. Forgiveness is a process, and you're in the midst of that process. I understand that. So let me help you today, because the beginning, or at least a big part of that process, is to understand that unforgiveness is not God's best for us. See, I believe that God loves us so much that some of the things that God forbids or that Jesus teaches is really simply for our good. That it's not simply some religious principle like so many of the Levitical laws of don't do this and don't do that because God hates it. This one, to forgive others, is actually, I believe, simply for our good. It's part of God's plan for our freedom. It's liberative. In other words, forgiveness is part of God's plan for our liberation. It's part of God's plan for us to live abundant lives. Not just some of us, but all of us. And if being religious about it helps you, then we can do that too. Unforgiveness blocks the work Jesus came to accomplish. If John 10.10 10 is truly a statement of Jesus that I came, that Jesus came that we might have life indeed so we could live life to the fullest. And since it is true that unforgiveness blocks us from living life to the fullest, then unforgiveness in our lives blocks the very work Jesus came to accomplish. Unforgiveness works against the work of Jesus. Let me make my case. How do we know that unforgiveness is central to the work of Jesus? First, forgiveness is included in Jesus' mission. Luke 4, starting with verse 16, I'm going to give quite a bit of scripture today. Luke 4, starting with verse 16, when he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, raised, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and he unrolled the scroll, found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, sat down. The eyes of everyone was on him, and he began by saying, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus reads the Isaiah text and, and then says, It's fulfilled today right here with me. In other words, his coming and his work fulfills the scripture from Isaiah, and the scripture he reads from Isaiah includes forgiveness. You didn't hear it? Let's go through it. To bring good news to the poor. Maybe part of that good news is forgiveness. Not sure. He, he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives. Release is, is, is aligned or synonymous with forgiveness, recovery of sight to the blind, to set those who are oppressed free, to set free includes forgiveness, but, but here it is explicitly. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In Isaiah's time, the year of the Lord's favor is referring to the year of Jubilee. Anybody ever heard of the year of Jubilee? It is the release that comes around in the culture around every seven years or so when all debt was forgiven. Everyone was forgiven debt by everyone else. For Jesus to say that he's there to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor was to lift up as a standard the ideal of debt forgiveness. 
The people surely heard it as economic, and, and I don't doubt Jesus meant economic, but, but I also believe that, that Jesus is saying that I came that you may all be forgiven. Student debt cancellation is, is, is very biblical and very Christian, in case you were wondering, and so is the overall concept of forgiveness. It's very biblical and it's very Christian. It is stated in Jesus' ministry. It's also demonstrated in Jesus' ministry. Excuse me, stated in his mission, demonstrated in his ministry. Jesus would encounter people who wanted healing and he would offer them forgiveness. We see this in the Gospel of Luke chapter 5 when some friends brought a man who was lame to Jesus and there was such a crowd around the synagogue that they tore open the roof lowered the man in front of Jesus and Luke 5 20 says when Jesus saw their faith he said to the man friend your sins are forgiven I could go deeper into that but I'm gonna keep on going Luke 7 when the woman who the text says lived a sinful life and she comes and she anoints Jesus' feet with her tears and with her perfume. Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Jesus encountered people who were distraught, guilt-ridden, and hopeless. Some from religious beliefs that labeled them as sinners, labeled them as worthless, told them to stay away from others made them feel guilty simply for being who they were. And Jesus' ministry was centered on the message of forgiveness. It's as if forgiveness is just as powerful as being healed of a disease. Indeed, it is. And this is why Jesus not only proclaimed forgiveness in his mission and demonstrated it in his ministry, he taught forgiveness to his disciples. Matthew 18, Peter, love Peter, he just acts outright about forgiveness. Peter comes in Matthew 18, verse 21, it says, Then Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or my sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answers, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times, or 70, some, some text says, times seven times. And some of us got our calculators out to see how many times that meant we had to forgive somebody, and we start making the tick marks to see if we had gotten to that, and we missed the whole point. Jesus knew that, and so he continued with the parable. Jesus is going to preach this morning. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven it's like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not, on, not, not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that very servant who was forgiven went out, the text says he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay me back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees, just like he did a few minutes ago, and, and begged him, be patient with me. I will repay you. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant and said, you wicked servant, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy? on your fellow servant just as I had on you. In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. 
Then the text says that Jesus says, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. Harsh and, and heavy. I almost didn't want to include that, that verse, but I, I dared not omit it because Jesus went to that length, according to the text, to teach the importance and the seriousness of forgiveness for our good. And so I'm grateful as I prepare to close that for this last lesson, the one who, the one given when the disciples also asked Jesus, they often asked Jesus to teach them something. This time it was Jesus, teach us to pray. Jesus said, pray in this way, our Father in heaven, may your name be revered as holy. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and do not bring us to a time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. In one of the most important lessons of Jesus in the Bible, and that is, what shall I say when I talk to God? Forgiveness makes the cut. Out of 66 words, when translated to the English, of words Jesus thinks we should say to our Creator God, forgiveness twice makes the cut. And let's, let's look at what it says. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Jesus, when asked by his disciples to teach them to talk to God, Jesus includes this, ask for forgiveness. The Apostle Paul reminds us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So, so Jesus says, ask for forgiveness. I know, I want you to talk to God. I want it to be somewhat brief, this lesson that's going to end up in Scripture. And Jesus says, I only have a little bit to tell you. Make one of those things you ask for. Make it forgiveness. Because I want you to be free from whatever guilt you hold. I want you, I'm in the mind of Jesus, I want you to live abundantly. And part of your abundant living is to be free from the guilt of sin in your life. But Jesus couples the lesson to ask God for forgiveness with this and promise to forgive others as well. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Forgive us our trespasses. Some of us use that language. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. The, the, the Common English Bible, which you all know, I trust this translation. I know some of the scholars, they, they tried their best to put it in Common English, but put it where we could reach it. But they, they were intentional about trying to stay as close to the meaning as they could. They put it this way. Forgive us the ways we have wronged you just as we also forgive those who have wronged us. In teaching us to talk to God, Jesus gives 66 words when translated to the English, and forgiveness is a major theme. Forgiveness for the ways we've wronged God, and coupled that with the promise to forgive the ways people have wronged us. Because both being forgiving and having a forgiving heart allows us to live life to the fullest. Remember, that's why Jesus said he came, so that we could have a full life of love and joy and peace, abundance and, and love of, of the food and of the cat and being a grandmother and of swimming and of pancakes so that we could love the dawn and the sunrise and the mountains and the oceans without something hindering our heart while we are trying to love and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Jesus stayed true to his mission, and he kept teaching on forgiveness, even on this lesson of talking to God. And you see, here he has an opportunity 
one last time to demonstrate forgiveness and praying for forgiveness. You know the story. He, he called a dinner with some of his closest friends, and on that night, he was betrayed at the table by Judas. He was arrested that night and he suffered under Pontius Pilate and they beat him and they crucified him and as he hung on the cross, he looked out at those he had helped. Have you ever helped somebody who betrayed you? He looked at all those he had healed and, and all those he had fed and he tried to teach and, and he looked out at his friends, those he could find because some had deserted him. He looked out at them all and he said God forgive them for they know not what they do this was so poignant because Jesus who is love who commanded us to love which is the fullness of life demonstrated his love even toward us and his love even towards those who crucified him by forgiving them and asking that God do the same. How much more shall we, who say we love God whom we've never seen, forgive those who we have the opportunity to see often? Forgiveness is our faith. Forgiveness is our freedom. Forgiveness is the key to our joy and to the zeal and zest for life. It is the key to what has been missing possibly in your life. It's not easy, but it's necessary. So necessary that Jesus made it part of his mission, his ministry, and he made us promise to forgive in our talking to God. But it's a promise wrapped up in a prayer which tells me that it takes the power of God in our lives for some of us to forgive. I know you can't do it in your own power. I believe that's why Jesus wrapped it in a prayer and said, pray it. Lord, help me for, to forgive. Lord, restore my relationship with my loved one. It's going to take your power, God, so I'm praying. Because I want the fullness of life that you have for me. And I want to be able to help others come to the fullness of life. So Lord, restore. Lord, help me forgive and forgive me. If by chance that person is no longer alive, then pray, Lord, give me peace down in my spirit and my soul. Lord, heal the pain and the hurt. Lord, forgive me. And I'll do my best to forgive others, but I need your help, Lord. I, I implore you that forgiveness is central to our faith. Not because of some religious purposes. Because it's simply good for us. Because a God who loves us so much wants us to love and enjoy all that God has provided, including our family, and our neighbors, and even that one who hurt you. So God is teaching us, love your neighbor as yourself, forgive your neighbor, your family, your friends, and guess what? Even forgive yourself. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.